Hey everybody, so today we're checking out how I approach recording screaming or death metal style vocals. You know, the cookie monster gargling with razor blade sound. Now, personally, I prefer singers, but hey, I get it. Everybody is trying to out evil each other and this vocal style is very popular. Apparently there's a lot of evil out there. I've certainly recorded enough bands doing it. Now, from an engineering standpoint, the style is dead simple. Throw up an SM7 onto a stand, put up a pop filter, get your levels on your mic pre, make sure the vocalist is at the proper level, and run it into a compressor. Hit record, and away you go, and really, that's all there is to it. The difficulty with recording this style comes from the vocalist. Some guys can't work on a stand, and that's not so bad, and SM7 is very difficult to make it sound bad, even if people do try. The issue I have with taking the mic off the stand is that you lose a pop filter and that the SM7 can be more susceptible to pops and hard consonants. That would be the P's and the T's and the K's. To understand what I'm getting at, hold your hand out in front of your mouth about six inches away and say P and T. You'll feel a blast of air. That's called a plosive and can make a microphone sound like it's farting in the low end. Now, the effect will vary from vocalist to vocalist. I'm really susceptible to it and I can't record a voiceover on an SM7 without an extra pop filter in there. And that's even though the SM7 has grating and a windscreen. So if you're gonna work with a vocalist off the stand, proceed with caution and watch out for those plosives because they will ruin your takes. Now, please bear in mind, if you don't have an SM7, that's perfectly fine. Condenser mics will work great too. I've done a couple of heavier records using a U87 on the screaming vocals and they turned out fine. Truth is, just about everyone's using an SM7 these days, so if you're looking for your own sound, try a different mic. Dynamic, condenser, it really doesn't matter. But if you have the means, shoot out several mics with a vocalist and see what works best for his sound. Have him bring his stage mic along as well. It just might be the thing you're looking for. Now, this is where it gets difficult when the vocalist insists on cupping the mic the entire time. In my earliest days of running a studio, I'd let the vocalist get away with this because I was just starting out. I didn't have an SM7. And of course, the vocalist knew the sound he was going after and I just wouldn't understand and he'd cup his stage mic for over the course of the entire record. And by the time Mixdown rolled around, the band would be complaining that the vocals were muffled and they'd be looking at me like it was somehow my fault. Now, I've already covered this and how to hold a microphone, but I'll explain briefly. If you cover the rear ports on a handheld dynamic mic, you are changing the pickup pattern from a cardioid to an omni. You'll also lose proximity effect, meaning the bottom end and you'll lose top end due to the comb filtering you did, you've introduced with your hands. In short, if you are trying to make your vocals sound huge, cupping the mic will have the exact opposite effect. Look, a stage mic like this can be great in the studio, but you have to work within the parameters it was designed for. Now, apart from moving band equipment, here's where singers get confused. Cupping the mic does have a bit of a volume boost. And if you're playing in a small club with a shitty PA, I can definitely understand why some guys do it. Louder is better, right? Well, it's a bit like the loudness war where dynamics have been sacrificed in the name of volume. If you compare a loud master with a proper master that's been turned up to match the loud master, the proper master will win every single time. It's kind of the same principle with mic cupping. Yeah, it's louder, but if the guy running the board had a clue what the hell he was doing, he could bring the mic up without any feedback, no cupping required, and it will sound larger. So naturally, vocalists want to bring in what they learn on their shitty PAs into your studio. So to all you guys insisting on cupping the mic in the studio, please pay attention. I want you to hold your hand out in front of your mouth about eight inches this time, make a fist and punch yourself in the fucking face, you idiots. All right, let me put it another way. I guarantee you this. If you keep your hands the hell away from the microphone's diaphragm, it won't sound worse. This is not some magic form. It's not Expelliarmus. It's not going to make you sound bigger than you are. You can only take away. Now, you can use the technique creatively on, say, an SM7 if you want to make a particular passage sound smaller. I've seen guys use one hand on the side, and that's going to introduce a comb filter effect, and it'll make the voice sound smaller. 
And that is great if you want to back off the intensity for a moment and then take your hand off and hit full on. It's the guys who insist on doing this for the entirety of a record. That's what ruins the record. Look, special effects are cool. The trick is to not use them all the time because that's what makes them special. You want a cool special effect? A technique I used to use would be to sing through a small lampshade. And that makes for a quick and dirty bandpass effect. And you can definitely get some attention on stage with it as well. You can also use the same effect by rolling up some Bristol board or light cardboard into a cone and yelling through that. The original megaphones worked on this concept because they couldn't build amplifiers small enough yet to fit in the end. Same effect, louder but smaller. I'm so brutal! Of course, if you just can't get the singer to see reason, after all, you've only been recording for two decades, what could you possibly know about metal vocals? Have him record two takes, one his way and one your way, and have the band decide what sounds best. Just don't tell them which track is which until they've made the choice. I had a session a few years ago where the vocalist insisted on cupping. So I threw an SM7 up on the stand and put up a pop filter and I'm like, <laughs> okay, cup this. And I shit you not, the guy actually tried. He put his hands up to his mouth and away he went. So for a good measure, we recorded two different versions for him. And in the end, he chose to keep his hands away from his mouth. Once again, it's not going to sound worse. Another thing to keep in mind is good posture. I had one vocalist come in and assume this really strange stance, like all scrunched up like this. And I'm like, what are you doing? He, he told me that was how he practiced because nobody showed him any different. So I had to explain to him, look, you are not gonna get any power that way. And I had to work with him to help him find a better posture. Look, I get it. This style of vocal can be physically demanding and can, can damage your vocal cords. But if you're just starting out, or even if you've been at it for a while, grab a copy of The Zen of Screaming by Melissa Cross. It teaches some fantastic breathing techniques, like how to work your lungs like a bellows so you're not constantly running out of air. And it will keep you from hurting yourself. It is simply the best vocal lesson I've come across for this style, even if she doesn't know how to hold a microphone. Now, in the last episode, the question of double tracking came up. And yes, this is something I use all the time. Here's a clip from Tortured Saint that I've been working on, and by no means is this a finished mix. It's a work in progress, but it demonstrates the technique. And what was great about that session was that those were the only two takes on that track. The best vocalists I've come across in the style can nail their performance in one take flat. I've only had it happen a couple of times, but when it does happen, it is awesome. You guys have heard this track by Dead Man's Will as background music over countless videos, but you've never heard it with the vocals. That was one solid take. After we tracked it, it was really a question of, well, how's that gonna get any better? The answer, it's not. There is nothing like capturing a great performance. It's rare, but when it happens, it's awesome, and it reminds me of why the hell I started recording to begin with. All right, so that's it for this episode. Next week, we're gonna take a look at some mixing techniques for heavy vocals. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you don't miss it. Until then, good luck dealing with those death metal vocalists. You're gonna need it.